morning good morning hi sir good morning. Good morning sir good morning sir good morning sir can we quickly go live now hello ha good morning sir 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 sir, uh, you. sir you can start okay uh, yeah good morning and a very warm welcome to one and all watching so this is the curtain raiser event for the young neurology forum of the indian academy of neurology uh, before we begin i'd like to thank the indian academy of neurology and its office bearers for providing the young neurologists a forum and a platform associated with them to air ourselves and also giving us a platform to express ourselves and the cases that we want to present here so this is actually something that was discussed and started as a young uh, subsection for neurologists in india who are below the age of 45 and this is the first activity where we'll be discussing interesting cases uh, which will be presented by neurologists from all over the country how we decided on these cases were we asked all the people who are members of the ynf to pitch in their cases and we got a huge response and finally one case from one sub speciality was chosen which was deemed to be the most interesting i'm sorry to the people who cases could not be selected this time we'll try to get them in in the next time because we're trying to do this activity once every month and so or the cases will be presented by one uh, ynf member and will be moderated by one junior faculty as well as one senior faculty who are specialists in that field so with that brief introduction we'd like to start immediately and for the first case we have dr mitesh chandrana who is a young neurologist and a movement disorder enthusiast from ahmedabad and his case will be moderated and chaired by dr prashant lk who is needs no introduction who is a movement disorder specialist working in bangalore so over to you dr mitesh yeah uh thank you uh first of all i would like to thank uh, uh iain indian academy of neurology and uh, it's uh, i'm glad that uh, we have started this activity together and I hope it will continue for longer time so should i should i screen uh, share my screen yes sir you can is it visible yes yeah yes sir yeah so today i'll be presenting a case of a 40 year old gentleman uh, without any comorbidity uh, he presented to us with uh, imbalance while walking for last 12 years uh, in form of tendency to sway to either side as well as tendency to walk with wide wide base stance and he had history of recurrent falls and it was also associated with upper limb incoordination and tremulousness while trying to reach the objects he also had slurred speech for last 3 to 4 years in form of crowding of word while speaking and occasional uh, intermittent halt while speaking and current status uh, when he presented to us was he was he is able to walk with normal support and is still independent for uh, activities of daily living uh, so two main complaints uh, imbalance while walking and slurred speech uh, long standing Uh, there was no history on it of any abnormal posturing of limbs jerky or dance like involuntary movements of body or slowness of ideal or rest tremors there was no history of any limb weakness sensory complaints uh, seizures cognitive decline or abnormal behavior no history of any decrease or double vision hearing difficulty or dysphagia drug history was negative family history was negative for similar illness in the other family members but there was parental consanguinity uh, so uh uh we'll see the video first bolo january se december bolo january february march april may june july over september october november december ek thi 10 bolo 1234567891010 ha karo yes हाँ चढ़ती 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 
फास्ट लेफ्ट राइट लेफ्ट राइट लेफ्ट राइट चलो अच्छा वो कर एक नहीं आगर बीजों को बीजा नहीं आगर पे लोगों को हाँ ओके सो वीडियोस ऑडिबल ऐसा विजिबल क्लियरली सर यस मिसेज इस गुड या गुड या ओके so uh, other examination findings that were not covered in the video were uh, bilateral uh, hill knee sheen was positive he has uh, bilateral pescevus uh, he had generalized areflexia with bilateral uh, mute plantar response and impaired joint position and vibration sense up to bilateral ankle and he didn't have any evidence of parkinsonism pyramidal sign or motor weakness there was no history of vertical socket slowing or square wave jerks no history of any no evidence of ka freeing or oculocutaneous tel injectasia or Uh, xanthomas in tendon or periorbital region and the cognition was normal so this were the other positive findings so clinical summary 40 year old gentleman with gradually slowly progressive probable cerebellar ataxia uh, plus some extra pyramidal signs in form of uh, left upper limb dystonia with some tremors and due to uh, areflexia and uh, uh, impaired joint position vibration sense probably sensory motor axonal neuropathy with bilateral pescevus comments i think you're done to your first yeah yeah i i i have, I have summarized yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes yes i, I think uh, it's a uh, important that uh, what we are looking here is around a, a 40 year old gentleman mid age gentleman who is having a long standing symptoms yes. initially when you told that he was having difficulty in walking and falls yeah i was also worried that usually patients with attacks here we don't wouldn't have falls to begin with if a chronic attacks are patients are there uh, if there was severe spasticity was there was there another question what i was thinking about in my mind when you are talking about that so if you take away other things what you are told now if you look into that point i would have thought about something with uh, attacks component and some spastic component and primarily these things which are slowly progressing over a period of time this is what could have been my initial thought process going on and over a period of time these symptoms have been slowly increasing yeah in addition what you can also see is at examination when you did an examination down there there is a clear cut cerebellar features are there there is a finger nose incoordination is there yeah. mild intention tremors are there yeah. uh, not only that uh, what you could notice a clear cut i feel uh, not even doubtful there is a clear cut dystonic posturing of fingers yeah. is there there's a very clearly notice at yes. fingers and wrist also i feel there is some amount of a dystonic posturing down there yeah. and not only that uh, in addition to that his uh, hand coordination with this diadocanesis are there you can notice i definitely the circuits were impaired they were slow oh. and they were undershooting what you can notice down and uh, while walking i was not very much convinced about whether he had ataxic component or not Uh, I mean, sorry. Uh, you know, whether he had a spastic component or not, it was primarily a taxic component was there. So I was not very sure. Neither on uh, you are not written about that. I'll take it on no. a face value that there is no spasticity which was no, there. no spasticity. Sorry, he didn't have any pyramidal signs. Fine. So yeah. now what we have uh, is a uh, middle-aged gentleman who is having a long-standing, slowly progressive ataxic syndrome with yes. a reflex. Yeah, what is going on? So commonly, if it was a younger group, we would have looked into possibly with. uh young onset or uh, childhood onset ataxic syndrome with absent reflexes would have been our primary diagnosis what we looked into from that perspective yes. uh, in those set of patients commonly what we would have thought about all spastic attacks or something like that would be our thought processes to have it yes. uh, coming at this age group because i started to have symptom around 20s and 30s uh, yes. we do know that uh, even isolated spinal cerebellar ataxia patient that's what we need to keep in mind because in indian setup when you are looking into it spinal yes. cerebellar ataxias will be common and uh, uh, without knowing anything else what i can tell that uh, this can fit into a well known spinal cerebellar ataxia syndrome what we we'll know it where we know that symptoms are slowly progressive 
people will have extra mid up pyramidal symptoms in the form of dystonia or parkinsonism can be noted down there and yes in addition they are also having features of this uh, absent uh, Uh, joint positions and sensory symptoms could be there in this set of patients and exactly. bilateral pest chaos it just indicates towards a chronic illness what is going on down there whether it is part of the primary syndrome or it is sequelae of the syndrome what is there that also has to be sorted out yes. probably if you can give us some more thought process or, or some other differential diagnosis what you are looking into here yeah, yeah. and it may help you to narrow it down further yeah, yeah. Um, so, Mitesh, uh, in the eye video that you had given, uh, yes. uh, I think the horizontal um, saccades were quite slow. Yes, and yes. And you also commented that the vertical were normal. And I just wanted yeah, to know: was there some hint of apraxia in the? Um, uh, no, it was uh, not there actually. Uh, but actually, because of some hypometric saccade, it was looking like that. Looking like he apraxia. Might be having, yeah, mm-hmm. because the saccades were undershooting. That's why it was uh, like. Okay. But it was definitely slow. But there was yeah. no evidence of oculocephalic dissociation or oculomotor apraxia. Okay. Were there any neurocutaneous markers, Mitesh? No, sir. No neurocutaneous other. No, no, no neurocutaneous markers. Okay. Should I move it, sir? Please, please. Okay. So localization was definitely cerebellum. So, uh, uh, differential. Uh, I thought that probably because of parental consanguinity as well as absence of family absence of family history. in other members the first uh, thing comes to our mind is recessive cerebellar ataxia. Uh, so the differential. Considering this clinical scenario would be ataxia telangiectasia, particularly very under ataxia telangiectasia because the age of onset was late. Uh, late onset Friedreich's ataxia can be one differential. Ataxia with vitamin E deficiency can also present with this, but uh, they have more uh, dystonic head tremors as well as myoclonic jerks along with that. But still, uh, I would keep it in differential considering the reversibility of that condition. Uh, ataxia with oculomotor apraxia syndromes and uh, ARCA type one, two, three. So these were the recessive, and uh, after that, as sir told, uh, spinocerebellar ataxia also should be kept in uh, differential, uh, considering the long-standing history of isolated, probably iso- cerebellar syndrome with some pyramidal uh, syndrome and peripheral nerve involvement, and rarely mitochondrial ataxia syndrome can present. Uh, but those have some other features like neuromuscular symptoms as well as seizures or cognitive decline, and some endocrinological features. So the uh, accordingly recessive followed by spinocerebellar ataxia syndrome, and then mitochondrial. So now okay. investigate. Yeah, investigate. Usually, uh, like when I look into any patient who comes to us, uh, yeah. yes, this is the way we classify it. Usually, I look into what is treatable diagnosis first set, then yeah. I go into non-treatable diagnosis. Okay. Uh, many times, helping us to put our first basket in treatable diagnosis will help to have a better outcomes. Even though less like even though you are not at crystal clear to begin with, only that it this could be a degenerative and other things. but yeah. many times keeping the uh, treatable disorders and working up from their perspective would be much more interesting for us yeah. Yeah. vitamin e deficiency e- excellent i do agree with that then other than that should we have considered rep sums also yes sir. okay yeah so but that, uh, sir in that uh, uh, the hearing loss as well as skin changes like uh, ichthyosis are very prominent from beginning and uh, you uh, rep sum can present late uh, in the 20s or 30s but usually it starts within the first decade or maybe max to max second decade so that's why uh, i probably didn't consider uh, due to this reasons fair enough. please yeah yeah sir so uh, so invest uh, any proper uh, uh, investigations uh, Uh, routine biochemistry was normal viral marker thyroid profile were normal serum lipid including apoe b levels were normal serum ceruloplasmin was uh, normal uh, vitamin e levels were actually high because he was already on uh, uh, vitamin e replacement before it, uh, he came to me uh, and uh, 2d echo was not uh, suggestive of any evidence of cardiomyopathy or low ejection fraction and fundus was normal there was no evidence of optic atrophy or retinitis pigmentosa so these were the basic investigations uh, that were done out so, of curiosity normally yes. when we do I mean, just for a teaching point for all of yeah, yes. so many people when they are listening here uh, the question comes to is whether i should have worked up for wilson disease or not right we have worked up for ceruloplasmin yes. levels here yes. so patient coming with ataxia as a primary symptom going on for 10 to 12 years uh, will that be on our 
what you call it as high in neuro differential diagnosis. That's what we need to look at it. Commonly, even though we tell that yes, ataxia could be one of the presenting symptoms of uh, symptoms. Uh, Wilson disease. Wilson. Most of the time, if there are 10 to 12 years, purely ataxic component is there. Nothing else has happened over a period of time. Unlikely that there will be Wilson's. But in the Indian context, Wilson can be presenting in any way as such. Anyway. But still to keep in mind, but yes, I'm just seeing how, why we should have done something, why we shouldn't do something as a point of discussion down there as such. Correct, correct. And given that uh, biomarker means lipomas not being seen, no strong family histories being there. Uh, and uh, what happens is, what are we looking from each one of the tests, why we did it and what is the importance of each one of these tests. Yes. Uh, should we have done a TPHA here or VDRL or serology? But, sir, uh, yes. consider uh, isolated cerebellar syndrome, sir, with this much long-standing history, 12 years. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Just, I'm just putting it for others, those who are listening down yeah. there, you're 100% right that uh, there are so many things why we go by our intuition that what is required and not yeah. required. Just mm -hmm. from the perspective, tell that when we look into, that's what when we're talking about the differential diagnosis down there, we are looking mainly from a treatable disorders. Initially, mm -hmm. always we should remember because if we have an algorithm and we go systematically for every case, what we are looking into it, unlikely that we are going to miss out. I know definitely other things would have been down there. And given that, we should remember that patients presenting serology is important to look for any, because these are potentially what we are looking for, treatable disorders. Many of these have a rare presentations and these are potentially treatable. That's what we should keep in mind as such. Yes. Okay. Okay. You so can continue. Yeah. Uh... So the next investigation definitely uh, was imaging, brain imaging. So uh, uh, there was no evidence of any uh, basal ganglia uh, lesions, but there was definite uh, cerebellar atrophy, but there was no brainstem atrophy. Brainstem was clear cutly normal. So isolated cerebellar atrophy was there. And uh, spine imaging was also done and it was not suggestive of any code atrophy. So isolated cerebellar atrophy without spinal cord atrophy was there. Any further, sir, inputs? I think it's a prominent cerebellar atrophy unequivocally we are noticing down there. Yes. And yes. Uh, as pointed out by you, uh, yes. that I'll take it on face value that there are no other signal changes and no other atrophic changes were there. Uh, so we are primarily what we are looking is a syndrome which is primarily affecting cerebellum or its connections. Okay. Yes, yes. And uh, during this connection, even though previously we used to talk more about uh, localization based, now we are slowly moving from localization to circuit based concept. That's what we need to keep in mind. Yes. Uh, even though many times when you term cerebellar syndrome may not be something down there, it may be in the sum of those tracks where the lesions are sitting down there. That's what we should keep in mind. And now here what we are seeing is primarily cerebellar atrophy is there. The way the atrophy has happened, way the things have changed without anything else happening in the brain. I even feel there could be some amount of cerebral atrophy was there on the T2. If you go one cut yeah. back, one, one slide back, if you, is possible for you there. Yeah. So you can show it to other side. I somehow, I felt my visual impression was that there could be some amount to be as a 40 year old gentleman. Uh, 40 years. I felt the slightly, the sulci were slightly prominent. Prominent. Mm -hmm. Just in visual impression, what I'm getting down. But yes, cerebellar atrophy is disproportionately atrophy and there is no hyperintense signals changes. What I would try to see either at the middle cerebral peduncle, what you are showing down there or in the pons, anything I can look down. Yes. So basically we are looking into an isolated cerebellar syndrome, uh, which is isolated in the family. So probably an autosomal, go ahead, you talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so what next other investigations? Uh, uh, Further investigations like uh, serum albumin was done, uh, CPK total was 65, and serum pyruvate lactate were also normal. Uh, so now, conduction. Why did well we do these investigations? Uh, yeah. yeah, so for I can tell that also so that others will yeah, know yeah. that why so from I, step one to yeah, step so, two, why we went that. Yeah, way. yeah. So, considering recessive cerebellar ataxia syndrome, uh, serum albumin and CPK total, uh, serum albumin can be low and CPK can be high in ataxia with oculomotor apraxia type 1. And serum pyruvate lactate level were done for mitochondrial ataxia syndrome. Uh, then, because uh, uh, there was a definite uh, uh, clinical evidence of uh, neuropathic uh, sign, uh, like there were signs of neuropathy, so NCS was done. It was suggestive of uh, 
uh, all snaps were absent and c map of bilateral peroneal motor nerves were low so it was more of sensory more than motor axonal polyneuropathy affecting lower limbs more than upper limbs and considering that uh, initially definitely the age of onset and some things are odd but uh, this testing, uh, genetic testings were done outside before uh, they presented to me. Uh, genetic testing for Friedrich's ataxia and uh, spinocerebellar uh, ataxia panel were done, which were negative. Considering that still Friedrich's ataxia is the most common cause of recessive cerebellar ataxia, it was done uh, by a neurologist from outside and a scar panel was also negative. So any further investigations? What else we are missing down What about yes. alpha fetoprotein? Yeah, yeah, alpha alpha fetoprotein. Fetoprotein. yeah, so it's uh, it's missing. So alpha fetoprotein was uh, high. Uh, so the normal range is up to 8 nanogram per ml. So it was 33.27 nanogram per ml. Uh, so now what can be the diagnosis? What should be the diagnosis? You tell us now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, considering that uh, it can be a text with telangiectasia like variant AT, but uh, the, uh, then uh, we did the clinical exome sequencing of this patient and it turned out to be a uh, uh, senatexin mutation and it was homozygous pathogenic mutation uh, in the exome 24. Uh, so, it, uh, final diagnosis was ataxia with oculomotor apraxia type 2. So, this was the final diagnosis. And uh, any comments? So I think uh, probably what we found here uh, in the initial phases, probably I wouldn't have considered to me uh, fair enough what my thought process would have gone there yeah. uh, in the during initial history phase. And even though the eye movements were abnormal and that would be very low in my differential diagnosis because at the age when the symptoms have happened, how the other clinical symptoms have developed and the way we have reached out, uh, I would have got only this diagnosis based upon probably on the genetic testing for myself. Okay, that's the way I would like to put it. And why I want to tell this sometimes people should also need to understand that even though upfront, even though we see in the list of differential diagnosis, many times we don't consider it. And uh, these are the diagnosis what we get based upon the genetic testing down it happens. So when we send for a whole exome sequencing, that's when the reports come out and we, oh yeah, everything fits in there. Somehow I didn't try to think from that aspect. Uh, so yes. even though we discussed about this, so in this case, alpha fetoprotein being high, but without any other symptoms for last 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, uh, being given any cues, it would have been very tough for me to make a diagnosis of uh, uh, AOA down there. And uh, probably I would have done alpha fetoprotein testing other things after getting the genetic testing only. This is what my comment will be on this case. Okay. okay. Good. If you had any other way for you, why you made yeah. that uh, uh, initially to begin with also, it will be a nice learning point for others also. Yeah. Many times yeah. what happens when we present the cases because we have worked it up, we know what we need to present it. And when it comes to learning points, how we learn to reach that point, that is also an important point. But how did we learn to understand this aspect? That's what also we need to look into it. Go ahead. Yeah. Correct. So there were some uh, there are some clues in this case uh, through which uh, though this is a rare diagnosis, but there were some clues. So let's see. Uh, so it is an autosomal recessive cerebellar ataxia due to senatexin mutation, uh, which encodes for senatexin, which is a DNA RNA helicase, a DNA repair mechanism and uh, protein. Uh, usually, age of onset in this AOA type two is relatively late as compared to other AOA types as well as ataxia telangiectasia. So that is in second to third decade. The cardinal features are cerebral ataxia with raised alpha fetoprotein levels in serum, sensory motor axonal neuropathy, and oculomotor apraxia. But oculomotor apraxia can be absent in up to 50% of cases. So that is one clue. Uh, and other uh, extrapyramidal features like head tremor, chorea, dystonia can be present. Sometimes pyramidal sign and pesquivus can be present. And MRI brain is usually suggestive of cerebral atrophy without spinal cord atrophy. So this was one clue. And if we see the key differences between uh, autosomal recessive cerebellar ataxia with raised AFP levels, so these are the differences like ataxia telangiectasia, ataxia telangiectasia like disorders, AOA type 1, 2, and 4. So amongst this, if we see then the senatexin AOA type 2 is age at onset is late, that is one clue. Progression is very slow as it was in this patient, but if you compare with other causes like in classic AT, AOA type 1 and 4, the progression is relatively far more rapid, uh, but in variant AT, it can be slow. Uh, cerebellar ataxia is present in all, but oculomotor apraxia again can be absent in up to 50% of cases. 
So that is uh, there in almost all other differentials. Uh, serum AFP level, that is one another clue uh, that is usually elevated, but that is moderately elevated in AOA type 2. But while it is severely increased in classic AT, and it, it is mildly elevated in other AOA types like AOA type 1 and 4. And cerebellar atrophy on MRI and peripheral neuropathy doesn't really, uh, uh, don't really help in differentiating this type. So uh, this was there's some clues. So most important clue here is I think serum AFV is the one thing that the level of serum AFV can help to differentiate between various types of uh, this uh, recessive cerebral ataxia syndrome. So there was one article in which uh, it was shown that uh, if we suspect autosomal recessive cerebral ataxia with oculomotor disturbance and raised alpha beta protein. So if the AFP level is between 7 to 15, that is mild elevation, then consider AOA type 1 first. And then other. If the AFP levels are between 15 to 65, then first suspect AOA type 2. That is because it is moderately elevated in majority of cases. And if the AFP level is severely elevated, that is 65, but usually it is above 100 or 200, then obviously first suspect uh, classical ataxia telangiectasia. Even in variant ataxia telangiectasia, it is severely elevated because of this enzymatic defects and uh, the actual uh, genetic defect leading to dysfunction of DNA repair mechanism. So uh, this levels can help. So take home message is AOA2 should be kept high in the differential of slowly progressive recessive ataxia syndrome with onset in second to fourth decade. Oculomotor epilepsy can be absent in 50% of cases. AOA2 can also have associated chorea and dystonia, which makes it difficult to differentiate from variant AT. Serum AFP can serve as a biomarker for this early and late or late onset recessive syndromes. And actually the levels of serum AFP helps in differentiating various recessive ataxia syndromes. So thank you. Thank you. Nice case, Mitesh. Thank you, sir. How is the patient doing now? Uh, sir, he is on follow-up. Uh, but he has, uh, like, uh, when I saw him uh, first uh, for the first time last year, now it's almost one year, one and a half year. So he's uh, relatively stating, not very much progressing. So he requires some stick support occasionally, particularly while turning and all those. But still, he's able to maintain his ADL. And I have also explained uh, him the, and uh, his relatives about the long-term prognosis of the illness. Good. Good. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I think, are we within time? Or should we are behind a few more minutes to discuss what is the suggestion from the chairs? Yes, sir. Uh, well within time. And thank you, Dr. Prashant and Dr. Mitesh for a very insightful case. I'm sure everybody was very intrigued because in the chat box also the diagnosis that were being given were late onset Fredericks versus spinocerebellar ataxia is the most common answers. And I'm sure AOA2 opened a lot of eyes, including mine. So without wasting more time, we'll directly go on to the next case, which is being presented by Dr. Shiny Joy, who is a senior resident at the Department of Neurology at AIMS New Delhi. And it will be moderated by Dr. Divyani Garg, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Neurology at Ames, New Delhi, and the senior faculty for the case will be Dr. Suman Kushwaha, who is the professor and head of the Department of Neurology at EBAS, New Delhi. Over to you, Shiny. Is my screen visible, sir? Yeah. Uh, respected faculty, uh, seniors, and dear friends, Today, uh, I am presenting an interesting case that is presented to with a typical presentation with an unusual diagnosis. I, I am Dr. Shaini. I am second year resident in Ames Delhi. And uh, I would like to thank Young Neurology Forum for giving me an opportunity to present this case in this forum today. The gui guide who guided me through this uh, case was Dr. Divyani, ma'am. So my patient is Mr. M. He is a 27-year-old male unmarried without any comorbidities, presenting with urinary retention, weakness of both lower limbs and decreased sensation over both lower limbs for one and a half months. Patient was apparently normal one and a half months back. To start with, he developed urinary retention, which was acute onset, associated with swelling in his lower abdomen, which required catheterization from nearby hospital and sensation of fullness was present. It was not associated with any continuous dribbling of urine. It was associated with bubble incontinence. 
and two days into his illness patient developed acute onset weakness of left uh, lower limb proximal and distal followed by right lower limb within a day and the onset to nadir of weakness was seven days and this was associated with decreased sensation over both lower limbs and band like sensation was present around umbilicus there is no history of weakness of upper limbs there is no history of any back pain radicular pain headache loss of consciousness or seizures there is no history of any cranial nerve abnormalities no history of any persistent fever joint pain rashes photosensitivity dry eyes or dry mouth or skin ulcers recurrent sinusitis there is no history of any trauma no history of any significant loss of weight or loss of appetite there is no history of any recent vaccination or contact with animals past history there is no history of any tuberculosis in the past no history of any contact with tuberculosis no history of any hospitalization in the past personal history he is taking pure vegetarian diet bowel and bladder involvement was present there is no history of any addictions family history there is no history of any similar illness in the family treatment history he was taking alternative medications for past one and a half months with no improvement in his symptoms when he presented to our department so uh, here here we have an young male presenting with acute on weakness both lower limbs along with bowel and bladder involvement with Uh, symmetry in both lower limbs well defined level and a band like sensation no back pain or radicular pain we have kept a possibility of non compressive myelopathy non compressive acute uh, acute transverse myelitis the localizations are weakness of both lower limbs uh, which localized to corticospinal tract above l1 sensory loss below umbilical level at the level of t10 and band like sensation of the umbilicus due to posterior column involvement and bowel and bladder involvement due to autonomic involvement so the differential diagnosis that we have considered are, as the patient presented with a uh, young male with acute onset transverse myelopathy uh, with onset to nadir within 7 days we have kept a possibility of demyelination as the first possibility more antibody disease and nmo spectrum disease and other possibilities were uh, autoimmune inflammatory in that sle jogren sarcoid bechet infectious possibility bacterial Uh, tuberculosis syphilis lime and viral herpes hiv neoplastic and paraneoplastic so here is the algorithm uh, for a present for a patient presenting with acute onset myelitis hyper acute uh, we will consider vascular possibility in acute we will consider demyelination spinal sarcoidosis autoimmune related and infectious possibility that we considered in this patient proceeding with examination general examination there was no pallor ictus cyanosis clubbing generalized lymph node enlargement vitals uh, patient was a febrile with a pulse rate of 84 and blood pressure of 124 by 80 mm mercury other system examination was normal and nervous system examination mmc was 30 by 30 and cranial nerve examination was normal jaw jerk was absent examination continued Mo motor examination bulk it was normal in upper limb and lower limb tone decreased in both lower limbs uh power in upper limb it was grade 5 by 5 with hand grip 100% bilaterally power in the lower limb was grade 0 by 5 from hip knee and ankle in deep tendon reflexes all re tendon reflexes were 3 plus in both upper limbs and lower limbs pectoral and trapezius jerk were exaggerated hoffman reflex was present plantas were mute coordination upper limb was normal no involuntary movements and patient was bedridden sensory examination patient pain and temperature was impaired below umbilicus vibration was impaired in anterior superior lat spine and joint positions and also impaired there is no postural hypotension no thickening of peripheral nerves no meningeal signs skull and spine examination normal so after examination we have an male with acute onset transverse myelopathy normal cranial nerves with motor level at l1 and sensory level t10 and reflex level above c3 from this levels we can say that the lesion is above c3 so here we considered the possibility of longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis with demyelination as a first possibility with mock and nmosd following for just hold on uh, dr shaini uh, yes, out of all these differential diagnoses okay ma'am what was the first thing which you have thought of from your history and for your from your examination Ma'am, first possibility was uh, demyelination, ma'am. Uh, the points in favor for demyelination are. Um, uh, for points in favor in favor for demyelination was uh, he was presenting as a case of acute onset, uh, 
the weakness of both uh, lower limbs transverse myelitis like presentation ma'am with no compressive features suggestive non compressive myelopathy we have got so in that demyelination because the patient involve uh, involvement of uh, bowel bladder and uh, weakness in both lower limbs so onset to nadar was 7 days ma'am 7 days yes ma'am so it was subacute acute yes, to subacute acute to subacute yes ma'am and anything else no uh, uh, actually actually as the patient had no fever or uh, any other symptom prior to this event with starting as uh, bladder involvement we have kept a mog also as a possibility because corneal involvement we are suspected initially okay yes ma'am carry on shiny carry on Ah, uh, yes, sir. So we have proceeded with the investigation. Basic investigations: hemoglobin was fourteen point six. Total leukocyte count was ten thousand eight hundred, and platelet count was three point zero three lakhs. RFT and LFT were normal. Uh, viral uh, viral markers were negative. Vitamin B twelve and folate were normal. Chest X ray was normal. Thyroid function test was normal, and ultrasound was normal. And we proceeded to in, imaging. Uh, imaging of brain was normal. Uh, this is his uh, image A showing. Sagittal section of spinal cord T two showing hollow cord involvement, hyper intensity in the cervical, thoracic, and reaching up to the corneal level with contrast uptake in cervical and thoracic levels. And in axial sections, we can see the central predominant uh, uh, involvement is there, hyper intensity is there. Yeah. With this uh, so this was the clinical radiological picture of the patient. So we have a young male presenting with a. a uh, subacute onset of uh, uh, non compressive myelopathy the imaging is suggestive of uh, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis involving the cervical and the dorsal cord we also see contrast uptake and the pattern of involvement is involving the central cord so with this so kind of central syndrome, cord involvement what now you can yes. narrow down your uh, differential differential this is so, central cord involvement yeah yeah so uh, with this kind of presentation uh, does anybody in the panel uh, including uh, suman ma'am and all do we have any ideas about the possible differentials that can could have been offered at this point in time so obviously uh, we would have continued to keep the possibility of um, um yeah an autoimmune slash uh, demyelinating process however the presence of contrast uptake to this extent and although shiny hasn't uh, mentioned it here because uh, of the twist in the case but there was also some inflammation and contrast uptake um involving the uh, meninges around the spinal cord so, so it's more often going in favor of some inflammatory cause yes so it was suggestive of some inflammatory cause with the uh, possible etiologies that uh, needed to be evaluated yeah. so with this kind of picture in mind uh, i think shani you can go on to uh, what we did subsequently yes ma'am so this is the slide showing uh, approach to uh, imaging of uh, transverse myelitis if it is long segment myelitis we will do the axial image central gamatal involvement as this as seen in this case and first we will consider the possibility of demyelination in nmo and mo followed by autoimmune sarcoid paraneoplastic neoplastic and as the patient had an involvement of corneas we will have to rule out dural ab fistula also so demyelination work up was done which was nmo mog was negative ana ana anka was negative ace levels were normal csf analysis showed cells 160 lymphocyte 100% sugar of 40 for an rbs of 120 and protein was 223 cryptococcal was negative gram stain and culture were negative gene expert and tb pcr was negative malignant cytology was negative so what now now this is this was a very peculiar turn in the case so we have a csf that shows the presence of cells low sugar and elevated protein so um so now what do we do i would like to know what uh, everyone would have done in this scenario but we we didn't have any uh, positivity for tuberculosis or fungal because uh, csf markers were negative including gene expert and as we uh, worked up for the systemic part also chest x ray ultrasound abdomen all of that didn't really come up with anything so what would you have done in this scenario the as levels were Base levels were forty, which is okay. within normal limits. Normal limits, okay. A lot of uh, comments are coming in from the audience with possibilities of um, brucella, limes, um, viral infections, HSV. HSV. Yes. So it seems to be going towards infection. 
Um, what kind of infection? Um, we weren't sure because this was part of our basic workup. Whatever we had done was like coming up as negative. So we had to go one step further. So, uh, so Shiny, what did we do next? Okay, we did the further workup. So the breakthrough was this. Our patient's serum VDRL was reactive. So we did the triponemal test also. Triponemal test also reactive. In CSF also, VDRL and TPHA came reactive. So Procella was negative and Limes were negative. So on repeated questionnaire with the patient, he revealed that he had a high-risk behavior in the form of multiple sexual partners. So a diagnosis of neurosyphilis was made for this patient and patient was started on injection septriaxin along with steroids. Patient improved uh, in follow-up in terms of power to a grade of 3 by 5 and bladder symptoms also improved. So this is the repeat imaging that done after three weeks. And in this first image, the sagittal section showing improvement in T2 hyperintensity in the cervical region and as well as in the onus region and persisting hyperintensity in the thoracic region. And it is showing gadolinium uptake also. So uh, regarding few slides uh, regarding uh, neurosyphilis, Syphilis is caused by a spirochete bacteria, Trypanema pallidum. It is a great imitator due to multitude of presentations. Neurosyphilis, the term refers to infection involving CNS. Neurosyphilis can occur at any time post-infection. It can be primary, secondary, or tertiary syphilis. In pre-antibiotic era, uh, neurosyphilis has occurred about 25 to 35 percentage of uh, patients. After the advent of antibiotics, only 3 to 5 percentage of the patients uh, will develop neurosyphilis. Of that, only 1 to 1.5 percentage will develop uh, myelitis. So this is the pathophysiology. In one third of the patient post-infection, CNS invasion of the spirochete will be there and automatically it will get cleared. For if there is defective clearance, we can it can manifest as early and late neurosyphilis. Early neurosyphilis, asymptomatic meningitis, only cellular reaction in the CSF will be present. In symptomatic meningitis, patient will typically present as meningitis with cranial neuropathy. Most common cranial nerves are 2, 7 and 8 and meningovascular disease, meningitis along with small and medium muscle vasculitis. General paralysis of insane and tebis results are the late neurosyphilis manifestations after decades. How to make a diagnosis of neurosyphilis if suspected? If the patient is having no history of syphilis, do a serum triponemal or non-triponemal test. If it comes post negative, it is neurosyphilis is unlikely. If it positive or patient is having a history of syphilis, do CSF. If CSF VDRL come positive, we can treat the patient as neurosyphilis. And if it is negative and no symptoms of neurosyphilis, neurosyphilis is unlikely. And if symptoms suggestive of neurosyphilis and CSF cells are more than 5 and protein more than 45, if it comes positive, we can treat it as neurosyphilis if symptoms are suggestive. Sensitivity and specificity of the test. Serum VDRL in initial stages, it is 100% sensitive. In the late syphilis, it is sensitivity comes down to 50%, but CSF VDRL is 100% specific. Treatment patient, you should, we will crystalline penicillin G is a drug of choice and it should be given for 10 to 14 days. Procaine penicillin along with propenicid can be given. Other options are ceftriaxone 2 gram IV or IM for 10 to 14 days or oral or doxycycline 200 milligram BD for 21 to 28 days. We are giving steroids to prevent Jarish Hexheimer reaction and also to reduce the cord edema. And uh, once the patient is infected, uh, triponemal test will be positive for the lifetime and non-triponemal test will show us the disease activity. Uh, these are the case series of neurosyphilis from India. Uh, Ganesh et al. from Madurai, seven cases of neurosyphilis, uh, of which six patients were presented with meningovascular involvement. And Kyle from Assam, 16 cases they had, majority of the presented with neuropsychiatric syndromes, followed by myelopathy and posterior circulation stroke. Ramrakhiani, from Jaipur, two cases, one had myelitis and one presented with neuropsychiatric manifestations and two Jari SS from Pune, 10 cases they had, six patients presented with cognitive decline and uh, one each from meningitis with the cranial nerve palsy, ataxia, myelitis and one was asymptomatic neurosyphilis. Thank you. So it is important to understand that in the era of autoimmune disorders, we should not be forgetting the basic syphilis, which is... So uh, as shown in the series, there are a lot of cases reported, which usually nowadays we don't thought of. Dr. Divyani, I think you're muted. Oh, um, thank you, ma'am, for the comments. And uh, I think the purpose of presenting this case was that 
just as Dr. Suman has said, even in the era of uh, demyelination and autoimmune etiology, one should not forget the classic imitators of uh, longitudinally extensive transverse myelitis, uh, neurosyphilis being a rare but known presentation. And usually when neurosyphilis does affect the cord, it is in the form of an LATM and typically it will involve the cervical and the dorsal cord. And the few radiological uh, markers that can help us to uh, sort of think of uh, syphilis as a cause of LATM would be, uh, one is the presence of contrast enhancement, uh, which especially over the surface of the cord, which can actually lead to a typical presentation called the candle wax dripping kind of appearance. And the second thing is something called the flip-flop sign. Uh, these are patients didn't have, so we weren't able to show you. But uh, the flip-flop sign is when on uh, contrast imaging, you will see one area within the parenchyma of contrast enhancement within the cord. And the same area on T2 appears hypo-intense, which just suggests that that area is inflamed in the cord. So that's called the flip-flop sign, which is uncommonly reported. But if it is present, then it would give us a clue. Now, the role of steroids, I think someone has asked. So um, the treatment of it is obviously antibiotics. But the steroids have been given in a few cases just to take care of the cord edema. The pathogenesis is uh, basically meningitis, as Shiny has mentioned. So meningitis, so that has to be addressed with antibiotics. But the resultant inflammation slash edema needs, uh, sometimes may need uh, additional steroids. And the recovery was complete in this patient? Uh, yeah, Shiny. Uh, no, I'm actually patient uh, only improved, power improved to 3 by 5. And we are following up the patient. Patient is, uh, I think, two, one and a half months only. Now, yeah. patient had come last one and a half months. So, these patients may take a while to recover. So, um, the recovery might happen over the next few months. So, we will keep the patient on follow up and see. So, uh, that was the learning point. So, LETM, do not forget syphilis. Thank you. Also, I, I'd like to add that this also shows that we need not give empirical AT2, ATT to anybody and everybody who does not get a diagnosis on testing because this used to be the dictum that was practiced some years ago that anybody who's got a CNS involvement, which seems like a demyelinating pathology and you get everything as negative, treat with empirical ATT and steroids. Somebody had commented on that in the chat box also. So I think that that is also something that we should look at if the first line of testing is negative, go to the second line, review what else could be there before you decide that we'll just give ATT and steroids. So, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiny, Dr. Divyani, and Dr. Suman for that insightful discussion. I'm sure nobody in the audience suspected that diagnosis to be neurosyphilis and it will help in missing these diagnoses in the future. And finally, we'd go to the last case, which will be presented by Dr. Sandeep Kumar and Dr. Fahim Arshad from Nimhans, Bangalore, and will be moderated by Professor Atanu Biswas from Calcutta. Over to you, Dr. Sandeep. The screen is visible to everybody? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you. So, my respected faculty members and panel members, good morning, everybody, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to speak in this panel. So, my topic they have given is sentinels in the brain in dementia. You know, we all know what are sentinels. Sentinels are basically the caregivers of the watchdog or like um, the persons who keep watch and um, states and keep watch on any intruders. They act on any in, in, invading for, uh, uh, forces. So if they act against our body, then we may lead it to uh, uh, diseases like autoimmune encephalitis, autoimmune diseases may come. So coming to my uh, case, my patient is a 43-year-old female, non-hypertensive, non-diametic, hypothyroid, presented with complaining of behavioral abnormality since four years. Forgetfulness is two and a half years. Reduction in speech output one and a half years. Dressing difficulty is from one and a half years. Slowness of walking while one year. And swallowing difficulty associated with drooling saliva since three months. Uh, I just want to describe these symptoms briefly. So behavioral abnormality started with the initial complaint. Started since four years in the form of compulsive shop, uh, shopping, over jealous spending of money, aggressive behavior, over familiarity, blunt emotional response and decreased interaction with family members. It is associated with reduced personal hygiene. And there is some uh, features suggestive of sweet cravings and increased interest in junk foods like chocolate, ice creams, and drinks. 
Since two and a half years, C started developing forgetfulness, mainly in the form of misplacing of object, forgetting recent conversation, and forgetting switch of the lights while coming out of the rooms, and forgetting to turn off the gas stove after cooking, and forgets to flush the toilet after using. Language reductions they have observed since one and a half months. Usually, in, in it is in the form of reduction in the number of words which C used to speak, which gradually progressed to. Um, uh, to uh, production of only one word sentences, but since last two to three months, she started using gestures to indicate her needs. Dressing difficulty, she just used to hang the dress over her head or shoulders without wearing it. And gradually, they have seen in last one year there is some slowness of gait with bent posturing associated with some uh, posturing of left upper upper limb, and there is difficulty in falls, but there is no history of any freezings or falls. And uh, three months, they have seen some uh, feeding difficulty. There is this reduced uh, food intake with salon difficulty, mainly to water, but she was able to um, take uh, solid foods. Then uh, associated with drooling of saliva, but since last two weeks, she is not opening the mouth. The mouth is tightly closed, neither for food, neither to speak, neither to communicate. And she has been put on rice tube for food intake. So current status is patient is bed bound most of the time, goes for the walk when forced upon, uh, doesn't open her mouth, puts, uh, say is dependent on rice to for her feeding, occasionally responds to commands and communicate with gestures. This is totally dependent on a caregiver for activities, all of her activities of daily living. Past history, there is history of pathological fractures after trivial trauma, multiple fractures as such, before the onset of disease. Family history, she has a uh, family history of some psychiatric disorder, which they are not able to uh, describe it as such in her maternal cousin. This is the pedigree chart. So we can see the numbers uh, uh, in third row. The number three is the probat, and the number seven is the maternal, maternal cousin who uh, who had some psychiatric illness as per them. Now coming so coming to summary, I want to summarize the case. The 43 year old female with history of pathological fractures to trivial trauma presented with insidious on test and gradually progressive symptoms. Last four years in the form of behavioral symptoms like over familiarity, compulsive buying, socially inappropriate behavior with lack of emotional response, uh, followed by development of some forgetfulness in the form of misplacement of object, forgetting recent conversations, speech difficulty, dressing difficulty, with slowness of activity, end gait, with salon difficulty, which now there is tight closure of mouth with drooling of saliva. So analysis of the symptoms with from the symptoms and history, I, I can keep this, these are the domains which I want to keep it like this, uh, first is disinhibition, forgetfulness, it may be attention or could be episodic memory impairment. Uh, the speech is mostly I felt like it's an onfluent aphasia. Uh, dressing difficulty could be dressing apraxia, it could be thing and uh, slowness of gait, turning difficulty, it could be pyramidal or extrapyramidal with some bulbar involvement. Is there any comments from the chair? Ah, okay. Uh, a beautiful presentation of a young onset dementia patient. Dr. Sandeep has highlighted that this symptom started at the uh, almost four years back. So she was 43, started before the, uh, reaching the age of 40. Yes. And the primary symptoms which started, which were noticed by the family members at the behavioral abnormality, it marked any disinhibition. There was a compulsive behavior. There was uh, undue familiarity with other uh, members. So this was a, a very much suggestive of a prefrontal cortex involvement. And as it is a slowly progressive disorder, it probably has now uh, reached uh, to uh, involve the uh, uh, dorsal attention circuit. And then probably there might be a attention dysfunction or there might be involvement of the episodic memory as well, because in main, most of the patients who are having so much of behavioral problem, the memory could be an overestimation. We could jump to that, that uh, that might be involvement of the medial temporal lobe as well, but it is probably uh, difficult to say at this moment because so much of marked behavioral abnormality patient was having, memory could be because of the uh, lack of attention uh, uh, due to involvement of the prefrontal cortex itself. Subsequently, she became uh, non-fluent, speech output becomes uh, very scanty and uh, became mute uh, over time. Then he also uh, developed some dressing problem that could be uh, because explained because of the 
so much of marked uh, advancement of the frontal dementing syndrome, or it could be there was there might be involvement of the parietal lobes as well. And patient also become bed bound, developed dysphagia, and uh, there was almost difficult to feed uh, the patient. So all this syndrome in a young patient points towards a frontotemporal dysfunction, frontotemporal lower degeneration sub uh, pathologically, where there is involvement of the prefrontal cortex primarily, and subsequently it also involved the language function and and the motor function. Motor function is probably, uh, if it is associated with the frontotemporal dementia, there are two, three main reasons. One is that of the extrapyramidal involvement that might be uh, uh, because of the uh, features of rigidity or dystonia or Parkinsonian features, or there might be involvement of the motor neurons or there, might, there can be uh, uh, associated FTD, ALS-like features. All these things come to your mind if you see a patient's of frontal lobe dysfunction in a young patient. But uh, over and above, this patient also has very peculiar history of recurrent bony fracture in the past, which are pathological fractures, which are sustained by the patients in, in repeatedly in, in, a, in its probably in early in a childhood or maybe in the adulthood. And that points towards a separate uh, pathology or there might be a uh, other disease entity which might be considered. In a young onset dementia, we always think of any, as uh, uh, in, in, today, in today's discussion, we have been discussing, we try to find out any treatable cause. So uh, over a period of four years, the patient is having, so what are the treatable causes that comes to your mind? One is, of course, the vitamin B12 deficiency, but the symptoms are so much fluid behavioral abnormality and subsequent development of the motor and the language dysfunction without any features of any, any visual symptom, any neuropathic symptom, any ataxia, probably less likely to be vitamin B12 deficiency. Then, of course, the infections is very common in our country, like the neurosyphilis. Now we talked about but there was no uh, change in the personality or the psychiatric symptom exhibited by the patients. And uh, neither there was any ataxia or any, any cranial nerve symptoms in these patients. Then also the HIV. HIV is usually a subcortical dementia, so much of fluid a behavioral abnormality we do not see in the patients. But I can tell you that uh, we often see patients of HIV coming with a subcortical dementia, but so 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 much of uh, frontal behavioral symptom we do not see. And uh, there are many rare causes, genetic causes of frontotemporal dementias, which we come across like that of the um, uh, young onset dementia, like Nyman Pix disease, uh, like that of the, uh, but here there's uh, dementia was there, but there are no ataxia, no uh, oculomotor symptoms as uh, described from the history. And of course, uh, any other degenerative disease that can come, like a familial Alzheimer's disease, do not fit into this because so much of fluid frontal behavioral symptoms in these patients. So the clue in these patients is probably the recurrent bony fracture, which might be a separate, uh, 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 is not separate from the disease entity. And that is probably the clue for me going to a syndromic diagnosis. There was no strong family history. One, one cousin, distant cousin, suffered from psychiatric illness. So, but we are not getting any, any Mendelian inheritance pattern in this patient. So it is difficult to say whether he is carrying any gene, uh, genetic mutations. It might be a de novo mutation or it might be a mutation that, that may be autosomal recessive. I don't know, but it is not an autosomal dominant type of inheritance pattern. So I think... Uh, Dr. Uh, Sandeep, please, uh, please uh, go on with your. Uh, sir, as, you, as sir has mentioned, uh, the, uh, anyhow, the first, uh, because it is a young onset disease, first of all, we should look for reversible causes, infection, nutritional, or uh, any immune mediated. So, first, if, uh, first possibility I kept as immune mediated, it is autoimmune encephalitis or autoimmune encephalopathy associated with thyroid disorder. Uh, points for our young onset of dementia, female gender, prominent behavioral symptoms, and abnormal posturing and slowness. 
against which are uh, against is like insidious onset gradually progressive course uh, even though it is not strong family history but there is an history of some psychotic illness there is no history of any seizures micronos or there no history of any alter sensorium in between the second possibility which i kept is degenerative disorders per se because it is an insidious onset gradually progressive predominant frontal type of cognitive impairment because of it, the first possibility of kept is frontotemporal lower degeneration the point against that is there is prominent extra pyramidal and pyramidal signs and age of onset is maybe it is a very young age of onset because even the frontal lobe degenerations are seen in uh, is more common in younger onset of dementia but usually a, a pause in the age of 40 and 50 years second possibility i kept is leukodystrophies point for is like younger age of cognitive same prominent frontal subcortical syndromes and prominent pyramidal and extra pyramidal which is suggestive of subcortical involvement so we, uh, among the leukodystrophies which i felt it could be metachromatic leukodystrophies uh which usually presents with uh, frontal subcortical type of syndrome but point against this here is uh, usually in the adult forms or the uh, more than 16 years of age they have minimal or mild motor signs other are alexander disease other three are kept csf1 which is one of the most common cause of genetically inherited leukodystrophies which present with similar clinical features with frontal uh, pyramidal extra pyramidal with some parkinsonism features with uh frontal frontal subcortical behavioral syndromes because in uh, adenoleukodystrophy i kept it very low because uh, older age group usually present with uh, myelopathies but there is entity called uh, cerebral alds which is generally seen in adult male persons and it is rapidly progressive it is uh, i keep it very low because there is history of uh, pathological fractures to trivial trauma even though it is very rare entity i thought of a disease called nasu hopola disease which could be an, a diagnosis of exclusion uh, further next i kept it, uh, uh, neurometabolic like wilson's and neurofetinopathy because of pyramidal extra pyramidal and cognitive impairment but the point against i felt like the cognitive impairment is the initial symptom that is more prominent than motor symptom there is absence of chorea tremor and ataxia nutritional causes as i already mentioned vitamin b12 should be ruled out but in uh, points against are insidious onset progressive course pyramidal extramural symptoms are more prominent and some suggest your family histories now coming to clinical examination what i got the patient is conscious was able to understand simple commands there is no kf ring extraocular muscle uh, uh, movement are full sacs and pursues were normal there is no hepatomegaly mmsc msc was not we were not able to do because he was not cooperative but he was able to obey some simple commands like sit eat uh, was able to pantomime my just some simple gestures was able to hold the pen properly and try to write otherwise we can do we cannot do any other further assessments um motor examination we found spasticity in both upper and lower extremities there is uh, bradykinesia power was 5 by 5 abnormal movement there is an oromandibular dystonia cervical dystonia was present sensory systems are grossly normal reflexes dependent and non reflexes are brisk with extensor plantar gait i want to just show the video so you can see the patient is able to get up independently without any help there is no gait initiation education uh, the gait is uh, slow step is side gait is reduced reduce ground clearance narrow base while taking turns he takes multiple steps decrease associated hand movements and some abnormal posturing of right upper limb and there is some uh, component of anticholine in the neck uh, so uh, after examination the clinical phenotype which i want to keep is is an early onset dementia with predominant frontal subcortical behavioral syndromes with multiaxial involvement of pyramidal extra pyramidal with some family history of multiple uh, with uh, history uh, pathological fractures and um, to trivial trauma and some family history of family uh, psychiatric disorders the possibility of the examination i still i will still go with this uh, the thing which i kept here but uh, i told previously but i, I want to keep the frontal lobe degeneration little bit 
after the leukodystrophies and neurometabolic disorders. So uh, the, I would uh, rather say that, uh, yes, uh, the autoimmune cause is the, uh, many, many has uh, in the chat box have suggested, but uh, as the patient is having a long duration of illness, more than four years, so any autoimmune encephalitis presenting a dementic illness, the subacute nature, subacute course of illness is, is the primary key. And without seizure, without myoclonus, of course, the dementia and associated extrapyramidal features and pyramidal features, they, they are common in autoimmune encephalitis syndrome. But the so long history uh, is, uh, I will keep it down in the line of the differential diagnosis. Leukodystrophy, of course, comes in the way because of the predominant motor features. The patient exhibited so much of uh, extrapyramidal features like Parkinson feature, dystonia, and of course, uh, other uh, that uh, comes in mind, the Wilson and neuroferritinopathies. But uh, the thing is that patients uh, has a relentlessly progressive course over the last four years' time. Uh, with uh, become uh, mute and uh, uh, with uh, so much of uh, fractures, history of fractures in this patient, probably pointing towards some other differential diagnosis. Somebody has pointed whether there was any neurocutaneous marker like the cell, uh, uh, any any cell proteinous xanthomatosis uh, like features in these patients. Well, I know that. So there were no neurocutaneous markers. Sir. Okay, so please. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Atanu sir and uh, Sandeep. Just to add here, and I agree with uh, Atanu sir uh, regarding the immune mediated cause. So uh, we have seen many patients who present to us after three years of uh, after three months, which is the conventional criteria for autoimmune encephalitis, and we call them autoimmune dementias. And we had a cohort of patients who presented with an MDA encephalitis antibody being positive or LGI being positive. So that entity we still wanted to keep because uh, as we always look for a treatable cause because obviously for degenerative cause, we do not have any treatment as such, but uh, we always keep them uh, higher up in the list so that we don't miss any treatable cause. But I agree, obviously we do not have sufficient features to suggest that it could be anything related to immune mediated and only investigations can tell us whether it, some antibody is positive so that we can go ahead with the treatment. And yes, obviously the degenerative would uh, remain high on cards because it's a progressively a progressive disorder and uh, with a long course around four years. And outside, she was uh, diagnosed to have a degenerative disorder, though young. Many people have labeled her as FTD. And I can see in the chat, I think uh, many people have uh, given their uh, differentials. And it is quite interesting to see. Uh, still, people are thinking that immune mediated could be a possibility here. Paraneoplastic, somebody, have, uh, somebody has mentioned. And this patient's PTH levels were normal. And uh, yeah, because of fractures, calcium levels, levels were also normal. And then we were also thinking in terms of leukodystrophies. As Sandeep has mentioned, uh, we discussed this case in detail because it wasn't an easy case initially because uh, these, uh, in, uh, these uh, clinical symptoms, they are often being diagnosed to have FTD. And she did fit in the criteria for frontotemporal dementia. But though she was young, so that's why we always had to keep our mind open and look for other causes as well, while keeping in mind the treatable causes. Also, because we have seen patients with B12 deficiencies presenting with typical frontal lobe syndromes. Although, again, Athanusa mentioned why it could not be there. And then syphilis. Syphilis can have many, uh, all the behavioral disturbances which this patient had. And then, uh, as uh, Sir mentioned, immune mediated. So, it's still, we, are, we were thinking in terms of immune mediated cause because as of now, clinical examination, we couldn't really do anything in terms of examining her detail, uh, in detail, especially the mental status examination, which was not possible because she wasn't cooperative person that so yeah these were some of the possibilities which were we were thinking and uh, any other possibilities from the chair uh, persons from other panelists or maybe from the uh, audience i can see there are many possibilities which have been mentioned but anything else after examination i think uh Sunday, please continue okay, uh, please. Dr. Ayush has any comments no, no, I think it's very interesting and everybody is waiting with the bated breath to know the final diagnosis. 
So uh, investigation was uh, the routine investigation is normal or ANA, ANCA, automine, pineoplastic factors are normal. Ammonia, lactate are normal. Thyroid profile, calcium, copper, cellulose levels are normal. PTS level also has informed normal. TMS is normal. So coming to uh, uh, neuroimaging, which we, uh, which first first time keeping uh, keeping is CT scan, which we can see here there is um, basal ganglia classification. Coming to um, MRI, T, first image is T2 flare. We can see a frontotemporal uh, fronto predominant atrophy with some subcortical uh, deep white matter, uh, subcortical white, uh, white matter hyperintensity in T2, in T1 corresponding hypointensity. In SWI, we can see there is some blooming. So Sandeep, okay, you, you can just go back. So what could be other differentials in MRI? Mm -hmm. Here, uh, on CT and MRI only. Yeah, somebody has... Uh, CSF one R or SDLS. Uh -huh. I could tell why it could. It's not SDLS or CSF one R. It may be. I, I'm just thinking in terms of differentials on MRI. The differential MRI is a basal ganglia classification with frontal predominant subcortical. Uh, first, we can if we go stepwise approach for leukodystrophies. Uh, predominantly frontal in uh, frontal uh, involvement. Uh, there are few pairs of possibilities like um, X-link ALDs, metachromatic leukodystrophy. Uh, your uh, CSF one R can uh, uh, is one of the one of the possibilities. Another is like uh, I don't know uh, Alexander disease, but usually seen in uh, younger age of onset. Older is as such as in my case is usually posterior predominant. And if you come to basal ganglia disorders, basal ganglia classification we keep only as a basal ganglia classification with blooming. So it's more like calcium deposition. So most common diagnosis is past disease. And as we have mentioned, like PTH and calcium level were normal already. Uh, other possibilities in leukodystrophy, we can keep it as CSF1 and nasopolar disease. So the thing is why it is not still CSF1 R. It may be. CSF1 R has persist diffusion restriction, especially in the frontal subcortical area. And this patient didn't have. And but it may not always be necessary because we had some patients who didn't have, and genetically they were turned out to be positive for CSF1. So the possibility is still here because predominantly frontal and uh, CSF one r although the uh, typical radiological finding is diffusion restriction, this, this patient didn't have. And as I said, we still keep that also as a possibility. So because the patient has pathological factors before uh, the onset of symptoms, so we went for X-rays of uh, distant ankle joint, which showed multiple bony cysts, mainly in the metaph uh, metaphases. We can see the red, uh, red arrow marks. There is uh, finger finger joints, interphalangeal joints, and then also meta uh, metacarpal uh, um, and the wrist joint and ankle joint. Also, we can see multiple uh, bonuses. So, because of family history, young age of young age of onset with multiple uh, uh, history of pathological risk uh, uh, fractures, so we went for genetic testing, which we did a whole exome sequencing for this patient. And which before genetic testing, you they will probably have suspected something, any anything because of, of correlation between the yes, bony cyst and repeated fractures and the features yes, of dystrophy in the brain and the basal ganglia classification, frontal lower syndrome. Yes. So it points towards a clinical diagnosis of a suspicion of any any clinical diagnosis. Do you want to divulge, or you want to go to the genetic test? Uh, after genetic, I want to say. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the so genetic test is so mutation stop gap mutation, which is homozygous for tyro BP gene. Now, what is tyro BP gene? We just know what is tyro BP gene. So tyro BP gene uh, is a gene which encodes a transmembrane signaling polypeptide which contains ITM. ITM is an immunoreceptor tyrosine activator motif. Uh, known as tyro B or DP12. Now DP12 along with TRIM2 forms an immunoreceptor signaling complex, which is usually present in the cells of myeloid lineage. It is macrophages, microglia, osteoclasts, and dendritic cells. And it mainly helps in their development, activation, and functions. And it mainly regulates the functions of this path, um, uh, myeloid cell. Now the mutation of this TRIM2 leads to abnormal activation of microglia, uh, this microglia cells in the brain leading to increase in inflammation, accumulation of amyloids and loss of myelin cells. And in the bone, which I have not mentioned, sorry. So in the periphery in the bone, it causes defective bone remodulation because it's role in osteoclasts. So both these molecules are identified to be causative agent per Nasuhokola disease. 
which is a polycystic lipomembranous osteodysplasia with sclerosing leukoencephalopathy. Now there are papers like you no know, studies which shows that trimer two mutation is also associated with degenerative diseases like AD and FTD by their uh, role in accumulation of amyloid. Now coming to nasocular, what is nasocular disease? So I just want to tell in brief. Just was described in 1970s independently by two scientists, one from Japan, one from Finland, T. Nas T. Naso et al. and H. P. Hakola, and it's been named after them. So it is an autosomal recessive disorder, which is categorized sclerosing, sclerosing leukoencephalopathy with multiple bony cysts. It is also known as PLO PLOSL or polycystic lipomembranous osteodysplasia sclerosing leukoencephalopathy. It's caused, it could be caused by mutation of any of these two, this TREM2 or TYROB. TYROB mutation as a cause of nasocular is predominantly found in um, Finland and Japan, whereas TREM2 mutation is, is distributed in the rest of the world. Clinically, we can divide into four stages. Latin stage is clinically silent. Osseous stage, which starts in the second or third decade of life with swelling of the uh, swelling in the ankles and feet with pathological bony fractures. Early neurological stages like uh, starts in the fourth decade with frontal lobe dysfunction. Later stages, it now progresses relentlessly to, um, to dementia patient and leading to death. And other features could be how may have the patient may have myoclonus, gait disturbances, and seizures. Pathologically, there is extensive demyelination, accumulation of axonal spheroids, microglial activation, in, intense astrogliosis, and with predominantly involving frontal temporal lobe and basal ganglia. Imaging, there is cerebral atrophy with expectative dilatation of the ventricle, T2 signal hyperintensity in the subcortical and deep white matter, basal ganglia calcification, with loss of volume of the caudate heads, cerebellar volume loss, and X-ray of this patient so multiple bonuses. So coming, uh, so these are the some review which I got from the search. So these are the reviews which are very important for the uh, to have an insight of the uh, on this disease. So Nasu and uh, the uh, as we can say Nasu and Hokola, they were the first to describe. And the uh, other important is Palionova. Sorry, I can skip. I'm um, spelling it wrong. Uh, is from Finland who first associated Tyro BP, uh, DP12 and TREM2 with uh, this nasocular disorder. And there are a few cases which have been reported from our country. First was by Ramesh et al. from Hyderabad. He described two siblings who were born, in, uh, born, uh, born out of consanguineous parents. And other recently from Kerala by Krishna Das NC et al. So coming to our case, I just want to say now, sir. So our case has a young onset of on, young onset of dementia, history of pathological fracture with trivial traumas, prominent frontal lobe dysfunctions, imaging shows multiple bony cysts with basal ganglia calcification with subcortical white matter hyperintensities in T2, which is uh, with without DWI restriction and hypointensity in T1. Lastly, the genetic was source, the presence of tyro BP mutation, which is top gap mutation. So possibly we are dealing with a case of nasocular disorder. So the learning point which we, uh, uh, after this thing is, any young onset of cognitive impairment with history of, uh, we should always inquire about history of multiple pathological fractures, if any, and should rise about nasocular disease, event which is very rare entity. And any patient with frontal type of cognitive impairment with neuroimaging shown vessel ganglia calcification, subcortical white matter hyperintensity with or with a, without DWR restriction, we should always go for, uh, we'll always investigate for X-rays of ankle and wrists. Okay. So any more? Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting case. And of course, uh, so much of learning point for, for any, Anyone, I mean, the young and the uh, aged. The patients uh, with young onset dementia, of course, we always try to find out any treatable cause. And we have discussed everything from infection to, to endocrinopathies to vitamin ritual deficiencies. And when there is some, uh, if we exclude all these things and going by the syndromic diagnosis of uh, frontal, frontal and prefrontal cortex degenerations. The, of course, degenerative causes come uh, in our mind, but uh, for, if in these patients, the pointer was, there was presence of so much of external pyramidal features, 
suggesting the involvement of the subcortical structures and recurrent bony fractures with a very uh, distant relations as having a psychiatric illness in this way, in this uh, in this family. So I think uh, it was a very uh, well worked up patient and uh, highlighting the very rare uh, case of uh, young onset dementia. Uh, we all, all have learned many things from your case. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep and Dr. Fahim for uh, presenting. So just, this. just one question. There's somebody who's asked on the chat box that why is it called sclerosing leukoencephalopathy and are there any other clues on imaging other than basal ganglia calcification? Yes, Dr. Fahim, can you please? Do you want to answer? Yes, yes. Intensively worked up upon this. I don't want to take this opportunity from him. Uh, so, uh, basic, sir, uh, the main uh, the uh, diagnostic criteria we say is the uh, clinching point is here is pathological fracture and uh, law of bony cysts, multiple bony cysts with loss of trabecula, which is the main, uh, I think, which is the with, uh, with history of pathological fractures before onset of symptoms. And why it is known as sclerosing leukoencephalopathy because there is active, uh, uh, it is a uh, nasocular disease as such is a microgliopathies or because of active in activation of microglia because uh, in, uh, in the presence of mutations of tyro BP genes, which mainly um, regulates the microglial cells. And thereby, what, is, uh, what it causes, it induces inflammations and there is gliosis because of which it, uh, it is known as sclerosing leukoencephalopathy. So if I'm uh, wrong, then you can correct me. No, no, correct. Uh, that's correct, Sandeep. Thanks, thanks for that. The, the idea of presenting this case uh, was uh, to highlight the importance of exact diagnosis. Both this is a very rare case and uh, we often do not encounter such cases because this has uh, short-term and long-term implications. So somebody has asked for treatment. Uh, before that, the short-term implication is uh, these patients keep on roaming here and there in search of treatment from multiple doctors. And I think the point is, there is no point in going to anybody if you have an exact diagnosis. At least you reduce the financial loss for these patients. That's one. Second is avoiding unnecessary medication because these patients are being put on unnecessary antipsychotics, antidepressants, and they land in Parkinson's syndrome. And we do not know whether it is drug-induced or it's part of their natural history. That is one. Second, in, the, in terms of long-term, uh, the uh, the diagnosis, although, although we don't have treatment right now, but Gene therapies are evolving. They're coming in many disorders. And uh, we are sure that a point of, at some point of time, we'll have gene therapies for this disorder as well, right? So uh, that's why the, uh, the main reason is awareness. I think if we can raise awareness among uh, these caregivers and patients, the gene therapy may come at some point of time. So at that very point of time, we can really help these patients out. But we need to be aware of these conditions and we need to make an exact diagnosis at the right time. Thank you. I have a question to ask. Is there any uh, difference in the uh, behavioral profile of this patient versus the typical frontotemporal dementia, what he has described? The behavior profile is same as that of the FTD, which we see, or there was some additional features in behavior for this patient, like gambling you have described, something like that. That is what seems to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Actually, those features of typical obsession, hoarding, those features yeah. are not in this patient, which we typically see in patients of uh, front and temporal dementia. Uh, yeah, but overall, it's always an overlap and uh, it's difficult to differentiate at times because some FTD patients also do not have those uh, symptoms. So I think genetics is the only thing which gives a diagnosis uh, for such patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fahim, Professor Atanu, and Dr. Sandeep for that case. Uh, with that, we come to the end of our first webinar. Uh, before all of us go, I'd like to thank the IEN for giving this platform to us for presenting our work. Special thanks should go to Professor Gagandeep Singh and Dr. Vishnu, who were instrumental in setting up this Young Neurologist Forum. I'd also like to thank my team, without whom we would not have been able to put up this show the convener that is Dr. Meenakshi, as well as other team members that are Dr. Divyani, Dr. Vishnu, Dr. Mitesh, Dr. Astha, as well as Dr. Ajay Asrana. 
And finally, last but not the least, I would like to thank everybody from the YNF who participated. And I hope that the number of participants and the cases that are submitted go on increasing as well as go on getting better so that YNF can be bigger and better in the time to come. And I hope this encourages more and more people into neurology as well as doing greater things in neurology. Thank you so much for joining. Ayush, when is the next meeting? Sir, uh, we plan to have it every second Sunday of the month if that is available to us. Sir. Fantastic. Very good. Excellent cases. I, I think, uh, uh, sorry, I'm uh, just butting in, but the presentations were good. The cases were fantastic. Uh, particularly the last case was something I had never heard of. And extremely, extremely, I, I'm, I would like to appreciate the inputs of uh, Dr. Tanu, Dr. Suman, and Dr. Prashant. Of course, all of you guys have been fantastic. So very good and, and very good attendance too. Good. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much Thank for you, your sir. encouraging words. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. All right. Thank you all. I hope to see you on the second Sunday of April as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Happy Thank you. Have another Sunday. Yeah.